Dunn has served as Director of News and Public Affairs and University Spokesman at Boston College since 2008. In this role, he oversees the areas of media relations, social media, news and information, and strategic communications. He also teaches a course in Advanced Public Relations at BC for juniors and seniors. A 1983 magna cum laude graduate of Boston College, he received his master's degree in public relations from Boston University. Prior to joining Boston College, he served as vice president of Catholic Charities and as a journalist for several Boston area publications. The father of four, Dunn lives in Milton with his wife, Hazel. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jack Dunn. Thank you so much for being here. And I want to give a special thank you to Victoria and to Caitlin for extending this opportunity to me. I'm truly really honored. When Caitlin first came to my office to ask me to do this, I tried to talk her out of it. I told her there were 100 people on this campus more deserving than I, but if you know Caitlin and you know Victoria, you know they can be very persuasive. And when they said, we're looking for you to have an opportunity to answer the question, what would you do? What wisdom would you impart if this were your last chance? I realized I have four kids. God knows they're going to listen to me. So I might as well take advantage of this opportunity and impart this wisdom now. So thank you very much, Victoria. Thank you very much, Caitlin, for having me. I'm blessed. So what I want to do tonight is share with you six thoughts. Six pieces of wisdom from my own life's experience. I don't know why I chose six, it just seemed to, to make sense to me. So I'll promise to be brief and I'll open it up to questions afterwards. But I'd like to share these thoughts with you again based on my life experience. My background is simple. I'm a Boston Irish Catholic kid. I was born in a wonderful, loving, blue collar family. My parents did not have the gift of education but they believed in. They believed in education as a great equalizer. So through their sacrifice, I got a wonderful education here at Boston College and at Boston College High School beforehand. And I was so impressed by the, the men I met studying at the high school and the college that I actually thought about joining the Society of Jesus. But on the very night that Doug Flutie threw his famous Hail Mary Pass, November 23rd, 1984, I met the girl who's now my wife. Think of that. We've been married all these years, and instead, I went to serve the society in a different way. I taught at the high school, I taught and served as an administrator at the college, and I get to advocate for and defend something I love and believe in. I consider myself very, very blessed. So because I've worked in this capacity for so many years, people often say to me, what is it about the Jesuits that's so distinctive? What is it about Ignatian spirituality? that we need to understand. What's the takeaway? So for me, the takeaway in my first of six points that I'd like to share with you tonight is the importance of gratitude. St. Ignatius understood that there would always be stresses in the world, that there'd always be pressures. So the only requirement he asked of the Jesuits was that twice a day they do what's called an examine of conscience. A simple 10, 15 minute prayer that asks the Jesuits to reflect on their day, to detect God's presence in their life, and to try to discern the direction in which they were being called. The examine of conscience is a simple way to slow down and take a look at, it, take a look at what's happening in our life. And I recommend that before you graduate from BC, you do it just once. You don't have to be Catholic. You don't even have to be a believer. It's offered every Wednesday, 9.45, at Manresa House on College Road. How many of you have gone? How many have done this? Don't leave BC without doing it. It gives you an opportunity to reflect, to take a look at the moments of your day. And when we're reflective, we have an opportunity to realize how truly blessed that we are. And that those magical moments, the sunrise or the sunset, that caught our eye, kind word the professor bestowed on us. The text that came at the right moment when you really wanted to hear from a friend. The phone call from home that made all the difference. That smile that your little brother gave you when you walked into the room upon returning from the holidays. All those things are moments to savor. Moments of joy. And if we're reflective, we get to realize how truly blessed we are. How many moments of joy exist in our life. But it begins by being reflective, by taking the time to slow down 
and examine the moments of our day. So I encourage you to be reflective. And through reflection, you can't help but to become more grateful. And with an abundance of gratitude in our heart, I know that you can handle anything. My second point, my second piece of advice from a lifetime of experience is to give the gifts that you have away as gifts. How many of you might have gone to the sesquicentennial mass at Fenway Park in 2012? What a great day. Father Michael Hines gave a homily for the ages. That was his theme. Take your gifts and give them away. It's really at the crux of Jesuit education. To take your God-given talents, develop them, and give them away in the service of others. That's what this is all about. All of you have talents, unique gifts, special attributes that distinguish you. My advice, give them away. Because it's in giving away your talents that we find our true, true joy. <coughs> I went to BC with a woman named Sheila Becker. And then I had the privilege of teaching with her at BC High. She married a wonderful guy named Kim, and they had four kids. And they were the most amazing parents I've ever met. They were loving, patient, caring, fully committed to their children. All of us went to them for advice. All of us. Because they were the best parents that we knew. One night, over well, we dinner, they told us, you know, we've been saving some money, we're thinking of doing something special, we're thinking of <coughs> buying a boat or taking the family on a two-week trip to Disneyland. <coughs> and I said, good for you, no one deserves it more. And the next time I saw them, they announced that they decided to adopt two kids, two kids who were orphans. And then on top of it, to take in another child through foster care, seven kids in a tiny little house. They did it because they realized they were great parents. They did it because they realized they had a gift, a gift that they wanted to share. Sure, the boat would have been nice, but what they got in return was a lifetime of happiness. Take your gifts and give them away. I promise you, it will make all the difference. Because it is in giving that we truly receive. It is in giving that we truly find joy. My next point, choose to make a difference in your life. What do I mean by that? When I graduated from Boston College, I worked as a journalist. I would had some experience doing television work, so friends said, you know, you should consider public relations, you'd be really good at it. So I eventually found myself at Boston University. I know. I don't know if makes a mistake. <laughs> so I went to Boston University to get a master's degree in public relations. And when I walked in that first day in the College of Communications on Commonwealth Avenue, there's this big inscription in the wall. It's carved into granite from Horace Mann, the founder of the American public school system, that says, Be ashamed to die until you have won some great deed for humanity. I remember being overwhelmed. I was like trying to figure out where the bathroom was, and they tell me to be ashamed to die until he wants some great day for humanity. Academe loves those lofty statements, those lofty ex exhortations. And I do too. And it's what we want of you. We want you to do big things. We want you to achieve greatness. We want you to do all of that. But my advice in the process, don't forget to do the little things. Because it's the little things that add up. When I was a freshman at BC, we had the student involvement fair, the same thing that, that you have today. And I was walking through the middle of campus trying to decide, what do I want to do? Do I join the Heights? Do I join student government? Maybe I'll join a play. And suddenly I was drawn to a table at the end of the row. It's from the Big Brother Association of Boston. I don't know why, but I was drawn to it. Maybe because I realized how grateful I was to be here. And I started talking to the representative, and he said, we're looking for young men, college students, role models, who will be willing to give four to five hours a week to a fatherless boy from Boston. I signed up, and I was paired with a boy named John Esposito from Dorchester. 
John's father had abandoned him, his two brothers and his mother. And he was very shy, quiet, and for obvious reasons, mistrustful of males. So we came together, and it took a while. But we eventually developed a bond that was nothing short of pure love. I loved him as if he were my brother. I loved him truly like a son. John struggled at school. And I kept saying to him, John, failure at school is not an option. It's the great equalizer. It's what pulls us out of the neighborhood and gives us a chance. You have got to become a student. You have to make this happen. It's our way up. And eventually, slowly but surely, John started to find confidence in his abilities. So one day, the day I knew report cards were coming out, I stopped by his house, the <coughs> family in Templeton Street in Dorchester. He was sitting on the front steps. I got out of my car and he came running down. I said, so how did you do on your report card? He had it out before I finished the sentence. And he handed it to me for the first time in his life. He had two A's, right in his report card, right at the top. And I looked at him and I said, John, I'm so proud of you. And he burst into tears. <coughs> because no one in his life had ever said that to him. Think of all the love and encouragement and support you've been given. Think of the people who've nurtured you. And think that all around us there are people for whom that experience has never occurred. <coughs> I hope you will do the big things. But don't forget the little things. Because it's the little things. Words of encouragement. The ability to still instill confidence in someone. That's what makes the big difference. That's what adds up. So never take your eyes off the grandiose, but don't forget to do the little things. Because that's what makes all the difference in the world. My fourth point, and this is a difficult point, so bear with me. I hope that uh, I can get through this. And I've touched upon this point in a, a talk I gave uh, several years ago in Agape Latte. But I think it's an important lesson to share with you. So hopefully I, I can get through it. I wish my story with John had a storybook ending. Well, then I, think I, got, I wish that were the case. It doesn't. John continued to do well in school. He went to South Boston High School and graduated with honors. He got a scholarship to Northeastern University. He was doing such great things. I was so fiercely proud of him. And the wonderful human being he had become. And one night he came over to the house and he talked about his life's plans and he said, you know, I've been doing a lot of thinking. I enjoyed Northeastern so much, I, I really believe that I can handle anything. I'm thinking when I graduate, I'm going to go to law school. I'm going to become an attorney. I'm going to buy a house, and I'm going to pull my mother out of the housing project in South Boston where they were living. And I have every faith in the world that he would do all that, every confidence. A couple of nights later, John went out with his friends from the neighborhood. I talked to him so much about the need to pull away, but no one knows better than I the lure of city streets. And so he went back with his friends. And they got into an argument with some guys. And he was stabbed to death on a street corner, not far from his home. Oh, God, I, I mourned that death. I still do. Oh, God, I still do. I, I mourned his passing and the possibility that was snuffed out when his life ended at 19. And yet, as inexplicably horrific as that loss was, it began for me a series of deaths of my closest friends that I've never fully been able to, to reconcile. Two years and one day after John's death, my lifelong friend Glenn was killed by a drunk driver. And two years later, Tommy, the, the one commonality in our gang, the one person we all found peace in, died at a young age of colon cancer. 
I got to Madrid during my junior year. I had a wonderful friend, wonderful friend named Andres, who took me home at Christmas when I didn't have the money to fly back to Boston. So supportive in helping me navigate the, the difficulties of learning a, a new language in a foreign country. Andres would die so young of complications from AIDS. And then just a short time later, Paul, the littlest guy in our, in our neighborhood group, guy I'd known my whole life, would die of alcoholism, the cruelest of cruelties, losing a friend who was alone on a park bench by himself, with a bottle in his hand. All of those deaths affected me and they started to create in me a sense of bewilderment. I remember thinking, why is this happening to me? And I remember getting angry. I still went to Mass. That was ingrained in me. But I would just sit there most days. I was hurt. I was angry. And I didn't have answers for what I was feeling. Yet I knew I was blessed. I had family. I had, I had my faith. And I had the best friend than I could ever hope to have. My, my best friend was a guy from New York City, from the Bronx. My, my daughter, Siobhan, has met him. Uh, he was uh, her first crutch at uh, age four. <laughs> He's from a uh, Greek Orthodox kid from, from the Bronx. I was an Irish Catholic kid from Boston. He loved the Yankees, I loved the Red Sox. We were the oddest of couples, but we were paired as roommates in grad school. We developed an amazing friendship, a great bond. I felt blessed to have him in my life. And one day, he said to me, you know, I've just been given an opportunity to study, to take, not to study, to take an administrative role at the American College in Greece. And I was happy for him because I knew how much that meant to him. He wanted to go to his ancestral home. He wanted to learn the language of his forebears. And so while I was sad to be losing a friend, a friend whom I had relied on to get me through those dark days, those years of loss. I was happy for him, very happy for him. And he'd really come back every six months and he'd say, <coughs> and it would be great. And he did, he came back and I cherished those days. Some of the most enjoyable times of my life were when Nick and I would get together in Boston and New York City and just spend a weekend. One day during his visits home, I noticed that he, he didn't look good, he was thin and he looked tired, and I said, what's going on? He said, I'm just exhausted, I'm working too hard, too much stress. So I gave him a lecture about finding the balance, the same lecture he'd given me many times. And he promised he'd be okay, that he'd take it to heart, and that when he'd return, he'd be better. Around six months later, he came into Boston, and as he walked through the door of my house, I knew something was wrong. He was so thin and he walked with a limp and his hand was trembling. I handed him something and he handed it back saying, I don't think I can carry this, something's wrong with me. So my wife, who's a nurse practitioner, made an appointment to, for him to see a, a specialist, which began a series of doctor's visits and referrals, both here in Boston and ultimately in Athens. And in the end, he was diagnosed with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, Bill Gehrig's disease. A terminal illness that would take his life in two to four years. I remember when I got the news, I got on my knees and I said, God, you're losing me. Enough. I can't take it anymore. But I knew, I knew that I had to get it together. I had to fly to Greece, and I had to support my best friend. So when I went overseas, I spent a beautiful week with him. And at the end of the week, I said, I need you to know something. I love you. And I've cherished every day of my 30-year friendship with you. And he said to me, I need you to know that I love you too. And I know I'm gonna die. I'm happy. I'm at peace. And I believe I'll see you again in the kingdom. Wow. It's the most profoundly beautiful thing a friend had ever said to me. Here I am, absorbed in my own grief, my own self pity. He's dying the cruelest of deaths, and he's at peace. 
He's thinking of the kingdom. I'll never forget that. I went to visit him a few months later and he had worsened. He no longer could walk, he was bedridden. I said to him, I, I can't explain why, but I need you to give me a task. I need to do something for you, anything. Tell me something you want me to do and I'll do it. And he said to me, I'm glad you asked because I want you to go to confession. I couldn't believe it. I thought he was going to say, you know, paint my house, find a cure, start a scholarship, run the marathon. Confession. I didn't want to go to confession. I was still going to Mass. I was still hanging in there by the thinnest of threads. But I was angry, and I didn't want to go. But I made a promise to my <coughs> friend that I would. And so I came home, and I did what guys do all the time. I procrastinated, and I delayed. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to wait to the end, wait to the very end. And sure enough, I waited to the week before I was supposed to return to Greece to see him. And at Mass on Sunday, they had announced that the Archdiocese of Boston hosts a service called Leave the Light On, where they'll leave the light on the local parishes from 6 to 8 p.m. and you can come by and receive the Sacrament of Reconciliation within the cap with Within the Catholic faith, it's a way of absolving you from your sins so that you can obtain a pure soul. So that if you die, you have a chance at eternal life. It could be a movie. Someday I think it will be. I ended up that night going to six different churches. The first church, I knew the priest. Second church, I didn't like the format of sitting across from the priest. The third church, I went in and saw the mother of my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> and I said, I have like 30 years worth of sins. I'm going to be in there for half an hour. And she's going to be waiting for me to come out. She's going to see me. She's going to say, this guy's a bum. Huh? <laughs> she was from Ireland. And I could just picture her calling my ex-girlfriend who I dated from my first two years at BC and my last two years of high school. And I could picture saying that, it's a good thing you talked to him. He's no good. He's in there for 30 minutes. 30 minutes worth of sins. It's a good thing you got rid of him when you did. I left there and went to another church, and the priest was so old, he kept asking the person to repeat it, and she was so old, she kept repeating in a louder voice, and I could hear everything they were saying. I said, There's no way I'm going to go to confession and have to say it twice. So I'm out of here. So, I ended up going to six churches, and by the time I get to the six, I park my car in front. It's a church called St. Anne's Church, and I'm walking up the steps, and all of a sudden, a light in the church goes off. I look at my watch, and it's 8.30, and I realize, I can't believe it. I've blown my chance. I've reneged on a promise to my best friend. I was stunned. And God's work at hand, the priest happens to notice that someone on the steps turns on the light, unlocks the door, goes in the confessional, Turns on the light and awaits me. I walked in and I said, Bless me, Father, for I've sinned. It's been 20 years since my last confession, and I'm only here at the request of my best friend. Here are my sins. And I unloaded all the anger, all the regrets, all the shortcomings and transgression. And I kept waiting for him to faint. But instead, in the kindness of voices, he said to me, you need to understand that God loves you unconditionally. And he forgives you for your sins. He understands them because he made you. So all this baggage that you've been carrying around, let go. Let go of it. Because God truly wants you to be happy. And you can't be happy if you're carrying that inside. So let go. And all that I ask, all that God asks of you is that you do your best moving forward to try not to sin. I thanked him. I got up to me. And he said to me, and by the way, you have one hell of a friend. The next evening I flew to 
happened to be with Nick. And I walked in, I said, I want to confession. And I feel wonderful. And he burst into tears. Why am I telling you this? Why am I sharing with you the most intimate details of my life? Because in my 16 years at Boston College, I've met so many students who are suffering silently over something. Anger, grief, guilt. Guilt over sins committed, promises broken, expectations unrealized. Students were suffering over something stupid they did sophomore year. And so I need to tell you from my own experience to let go, to let go of that. Because God wants you to be happy and He wants you to live your life to the fullest. And you can't if you're holding on to baggage. None of us is perfect. That's the beauty of it. None of us is perfect. So whatever it is, that bothers you, whatever it is that constitutes your regret, your anger, your remorse, your guilt, let go. Let go. My next point, my fifth point, my fifth piece of advice for you is to cherish this opportunity. You attend Boston College, one of the best colleges in the world. It's bigger than all of us. You're part of something that's bigger than all of us. Cherish this opportunity. Give it your best. Take advantage of everything. Go to lectures as you're doing tonight. Talk to your professors. Reach out to that quiet kid in the cafeteria. Go beyond the the sphere of your small circle of friends. Take advantage of everything here. Because it's such an amazing opportunity. 20,000 kids wanted this opportunity and you beat them out. Another million would have given their hand and for them, Boston College was never within the realm of the possible. It's your experience. Take advantage of it. Cherish it. Because the commonality of all of us is we will get old. And I promise you, you will look back at these years with reverence. You'll look back at them and realize they were among the very best years of my life. I did a half-time retreat and a student said to me, you know, I miss a ton of classes because my roommates and I play video games. You can play video games anytime. Don't miss out on this opportunity. Take advantage of everything it has to offer Cherish this experience. Cherish it. And my last point. Believe in yourself. You got into BC. And you're thriving here. You have such amazing gifts. And amazing talents. Those of us who came before you look at you in awe. So much brighter and worldlier than we were. You have everything going for you. What's imperative is that you believe in yourself and your ability to do whatever you want. Know this, that in life you will fail. We all fail. The trick is to pick yourself up and to move forward. You carry forward our hopes, our aspirations for you, our dreams. So we want and need for you to succeed. But it all begins with believing in yourself. And if you believe in yourself, oh, I promise you, anything, anything at all is possible. To conclude, may you live a life of gratitude for all that you have been given. May you develop your God-given talents and share them with others. 
And you choose to make a difference in your life in all things, big and small. And you let go of the baggage that gets in the way of living your life to the fullest. May you cherish this opportunity and I'll take advantage of all that Boston College affords you. May you always believe that you are capable of doing anything. And in the end, in the words of my best friend, may we see each other again one day in the kingdom. Thank you so much for coming.